Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Now till now what we have discussed now first let us see let us review and then move on to the uh, move on to another module namely inequalities in science. But let us first review what we have done till if you slightly recall we started with the very thematic preliminaries concerning science, technology and society, the way these three forces of production namely science, technology and society have evolved over time and across space. And then we moved on to forge the relationship between science and technology on the one hand and science, technology and society on the other. Okay? I mean we started with the ontological questions and then from, from there we moved on to a discussion on how STS science technology and society is a discipline is a sub discipline which is a byproduct of a conglomeration of three important disciplines namely philosophy of science, history of science and sociology of science. Okay? And then we tried to discuss epistemology as a body or theory of knowledge, why is epistemology considered a body or theory of knowledge precisely because the kind of central philosophical political questions that epistemology addresses. That is what is knowledge, how is knowledge produced, how is knowledge generated. Okay? But the scholars of epistemology ignored for a pretty long period of time the question of ethics. And then we uh, see uh, the demarcation between natural philosophy and uh, moral philosophy. Okay? I mean what is ethics? Ethics is a study of nature of conduct okay? as we have already discussed. Why is it so? Why is ethics called uh, a study of nature of conduct? Precisely because of the central philosophical political questions which ethics addresses they are what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong and so on. And if you combine epistemology with ethics, we get philosophy of science. Okay? That is why uh, uh, it is very important for STS scholars to look at not simply epistemological questions, but also ethical considerations. Okay? Then from, from those ontological questions, we moved on to a more normative structure of science propounded by Robert Martin. There we discussed ethos of science, I mean uh, institutional imperatives of science. What are you, what, what do you mean by ethos of science? By ethos of science we mean effectively toned complex of values and norms which is held to be binding on the man of science. And these norms are expressed in terms of prescriptions, proscriptions, preferences and permissions. When I say prescriptions, it is a broad normative framework, proscriptions are those norms which are legally bound, preferences come under the rubric of motivational norms, values and ideals, whereas permissions come under the framework of institutional mandates, institutional values, institutional norms and institutional ideals. Okay? In this sense, Martin used these, uh, uh, these terms, these concepts. 
then then we discussed the goal of science as the as the extension of certified knowledge then we discussed the imperatives of science which are derived from the goal of science and also the kind of methods which science deploys okay when when i when martin said methods technical methods i mean empirically confirmed and logically consistent statements of regularities okay and then martin went on to flag four institutional imperatives four ethos of modern science they are universalism communism disinterestedness and organized skepticism whereas universalism communism and disinterestedness come under the broader rubric of a uh, mortonian goal of science organized skepticism comes not simply under uh, uh, mortonian goal of science but also mortonian technical methods of science that empirically confirmed and logically consistent statements of regularities that's why organized skepticism refers to the fact that we must keep on postponing our judgment we must keep on temporarily suspending our judgment uh, unless and until all facts are at hand okay from the ontological questions we moved on to the normative structure of science from the normative structure of science we came to methods of science and from methods of science we will come to inequalities in science okay the in 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 methods of science what we have discussed we we started with uh, uh, the famous aristotelian question that uh, that that what is the method of science okay the question what is the method of science is as old as science itself i mean how do we produce knowledge becomes central to the existence of science itself becomes central to becomes an integral part of of the existence of knowledge itself okay till i mean from from i mean till uh, in this in the 17th century uh, we we uh, came across a, a term called modern philosophy of science i mean the birth we saw we witnessed the emergence of modern philosophy of science from 17th century till 20th century okay we we witnessed two rival methodologies which suggested that there are two methods uh, uh, or there are two ways to produce knowledge okay i mean if if you slightly recall we have already discussed uh, i mean science is a term which was coined by wevel in the 19th century earlier science was known as natural philosophy okay uh, that that's why we discussed uh, how Uh, uh moral philosophy was branched out from natural philosophy in the form of ethics okay that is well. now if you look at uh these two rival methodologies in the form of inductivism and hypotheticism which dominated the center stage from the 17th century till 19th century three centuries taken together okay for the proponents of objective is uh, for the proponents of inductivism okay science starts with observations remains at the level of observations and ends with observations i mean observation is the source of knowledge production then what are what were the steps that we discussed uh, in inductivism no that in the inductivist schema science must uh, start with observation without recourse to any theory okay and from that observational data without recourse to any theory we come to the second step that that is tentative generalization which requires verification and then we come to conclusion hypothesisism suggests that no science doesn't start with observation rather science starts only when we go beyond observation because whatever observation that we make observations are not presuppositionless 
observations always involve certain amount of selection and selection is based on cultural relevance. Okay. From here onward, if we look at this, this discourse on, on these two rival methodologies okay, if, if, uh, from 17th century till 19th centuries, what we find in the 20th century the emergence of a dominant school of thought so far as the question what is the method of science is concerned. Okay? I mean that is positivism. That is why when inductivists argued that science starts with observations, hypothesists argued no science does not start with observation, science begins only when we go beyond observations, science starts with a hypothesis which is a tentative solution to a problem or hunch. Okay? In this case, if science starts with a hypothesis which is a tentative solution to a problem or hunch, then that tentative solution to a problem or hunch must be subject to some tests. If a hypothesis is tested wrong, then it must be rejected and uh, if a hypothesis is tested right, then it must be accepted in the hypothesis scheme. Right? And in positivism, as we have already, already discussed how positivism emerged, positivism emerged in a social, economic, political, cultural context, institutional context, ideological context, whereby we see the transition from transition of this of, uh, of different layers of society, I mean transition in the development of society. Society was conceptualized uh, in the form of metaphysics, uh, sorry, I mean initially theology, then metaphysics and then positivism. What are those things? I mean we have, we have already discussed this, uh, uh, that uh, the theological stage okay, tried to examine changes in terms of supernatural forces the otherworldly forces, the proponents of metaphysics tried to examine changes in terms of only natural forces, but of course, not supernatural forces, only natural forces. Okay? That is why they say, they, uh, um, uh, I mean the proponents of metaphysics used to say that uh, um, only nature mediates our changes, only uh, 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 interventions can be made only through nature. Okay. Whereas, positivistic stage suggests that no, it is not uh, supernatural forces or not, they are not simply natural forces, but human action determines oh, uh, what kind of kind of changes that we had, we, we, we have today or we are going to have tomorrow. Okay. Then we have discussed the central tenets of positivism, uh, I mean that uh, uh, to give you a few examples uh, what we have discussed, I mean uh, that science is distinct from all areas of human activity or creativity, because science possesses a method unique to it, that is methodological, that there is only one method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter, uh, that is methodological monism, that the method of science is the method of induction, that the hallmark of science consists in the fact that uh, all scientific statements must be systematically verifiable that is systematic verifiability. There must be a dichotomy between fact and value. Facts are value neutral whereas, values do not have any factual content. Okay? There must be a unilinear relationship between observation and theory. Observation leads to the formulation of theory, but the converse is not true. I mean theory does not lead to uh, uh, observation in the positivistic scheme. Okay? Then, what are the steps that we have followed in positivism? I mean it must start with, science must start with observation, followed by a set of laws, then a, a set of statements describing initial conditions and the explanation that we are going to make or the conclusion that we are going to derive from these premises that a, a statement. Okay, uh, describing the phenomenon to be explained. 
okay explains as critics to positivism suggest that no as a, as a, we have already discussed no observation is presuppositionless in the in the hypothesis schema observation critics of positivist positivism suggested that you see uh, uh, whatever observations that you make observations through uh, observations do not have any language or idiom for expression theory provides us with a language or an idiom of expression observations are not presuppositionless observations always involve certain amount of selection selection is based on cultural relevance uh, whatever observations that we make uh, they must be adequate uh, what kind of adequacy you want to arrive at adequacy can be um, uh, judged in terms of statistical generalizations also and also at the level of meaning generation okay this is what we we have discussed and such positivistic control of uh, science was systematically attacked by popper for whom what is the central question of philosophy for popper the central question of philosophy lies in the problem of cosmology what is that problem of cosmology now, the problem of cosmology is the problem of understanding the world including ourselves as part of the world okay if we dissociate ourselves from from this world then we are not going to understand this world then he goes on to discuss uh, context of justification and does not say anything about context of discovery because for popper uh, there is no uh, uh, i mean there is the, it is impossible it is not possible to uh, provide anything about context of discovery or provide a rational uh, account or rational explanation uh, of context of discovery which n r hansen and others they also um, brought about a critique to popperian methodology for popper what should be the steps to uh, uh, to produce knowledge what kind of steps science follows to produce knowledge now uh, for for popper science must start with identifying a problem a research question science must start with a question a problem and from that problem we must formulate a hypothesis as we already know that hypothesis is a tentative solution to a problem or hunch and as hypothesis argued earlier that uh, a hypothesis uh, uh, requires to be tested so also popper said yes it should be tested but it should be tested through the process of systematic falsification if positivist suggested that science can be cross checked knowledge the, the the kind of knowledge that we produce can be cross checked verified I mean cross checked through systematic verifiability uh, popper replaces systematic verifiability with systematic falsifiability that is why uh, 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 a particular hypothesis must be systematically falsified and the process of systematic falsification may result in the hypothesis being uh, refuted I mean uh, a hypothesis may be tested wrong if it is tested wrong then it must be refuted but if it is accepted i mean if it is tested right as hypothesis argued that it must be accepted popper deviated from this popper immediately said no we cannot accept this hypothesis because under certain limiting conditions under certain limiting circumstances such hypothesis has been uh, tested right not under all conditions in the world that's why a particular hypothesis even if it is tested right under certain conditions must be corroborated then systematic i mean corroborated i mean corroboration means uh, you must keep your hypothesis permanently tentative okay then a hypothesis in uh, i mean the, i mean a hypothesis when it goes through the process of systematic falsification okay is subject to refutation and corroboration in the popperian scheme from this we have also discussed a critique to popper then we moved on to kuhn okay 
for Kuhn every science passes through two different distinct stages namely pre paradigmatic stage and paradigmatic stage. Natural sciences namely astronomy, physics, chemistry and biology okay, only they have till now entered the paradigmatic stage from paradig pre paradigmatic stage because they have been because these four disciplines have been able to build some consensus about their respective discipline. I mean if pre paradigmatic stage is characterized by divergent thinking then paradigmatic stage is characterized by convergent thinking. If pre paradigmatic stage is characterized by plurality of practices then paradigmatic stage is characterized by uniformity of practice. Okay? That is why uh, Kuhn suggested that uh, uh, creative areas like uh, art, literature, music, dance forms, uh, philosophy and even medicine okay? perhaps they will not be able to uh, reach the paradigmatic stage because of the inherent uh, divergent thinking in these disciplines because of the inherent plurality of practices uh, implicit in these disciplines. Okay? And then he went on to say that no astronomy was the uh, first discipline to enter the paradigmatic stage followed by physics, chemistry and biology. Okay? What is a, then what is a paradigm? No paradigm is a model. A paradigm is something is the one which poses model questions not only poses model questions, but also provides model answers to those model questions. Not only provides model question, model answers to those model questions, but also provides the methods to arrive at those solutions. In other words, a paradigm is the one which poses model questions, tries to provide model answers to those model questions and also attempts to show and demonstrate what are the wage procedures and methods to solve that problem okay? in this sense. That is why um, perhaps, perhaps social sciences can never reach that stage of because, because of the nature of research questions, because of the nature of research problems in place. Now, then, then if you look at this, then what are the steps which Kuhn followed? Kuhn followed certain steps through which we look to look forward to the furtherance of knowledge products, insights. Okay? What are those steps? For Kuhn, after pre paradigmatic stage to the paradigmatic stage, within a certain paradigm, there is a normal scientific tradition. That is, when I say normal, I mean norm bound science, institutional framework bound science, okay? rule bound science, regulation bound science. Okay? And while carrying, I mean normal science is a tradition bound activity, normal science is a puzzle solving activity, normal science is, refers to the day to day research activities that scientists are engaged in. And within normal science, we encounter certain anomalies. Anomaly is referred to the unanticipated or unexpected occurrences or happenings. Okay? In this case, if when, when anomalies appear, when anomalies occur within normal scientific tradition and we do not have adequate acumen expertise within that existing paradigm to to address those anomalies, then that, that paradigm itself will be crisis ridden. Okay? Then the scientific community of each discipline of respective disciplines, they start looking for a new paradigm which can address such anomalies, which can address the problems of anomalies. And once once they find out a new paradigm, then a new paradigm will replace 
an old the the old paradigm or the existing paradigm but from crisis to the new paradigm is mediated by revolutionary science or scientific revolution what kuhn suggested okay e in this case if normal science is the tradition bound activity then revolutionary science is the tradition shattering activity to the to to uh, uh, the complements of the tradition bound activity of normal science okay that's why it goes beyond the purview of normal science to address the problems of anomaly right then when you when you look at this having discussed this we we moved on to a comparison between uh, popper and kuhn uh, we also uh, uh, discussed uh, uh, um, the we, i mean we made a comparison even between positivism popper and kuhn what uh, how positivist if positivist suggested that it is through systematic verifiability that we uh, uh, our science can be considered legitimate and valid for kuhn uh, for popper it is systematic falsifiability now for uh, kuhn it is not simply through systematic verifiability or systematic falsifiability but consensus okay that's why i gave you the example that whether india should go ahead with nuclear tests or not is it a scientific question or a political question it is the consensus through which we make these decisions okay but what is what what is the similarity that uh, similarity uh, among uh, uh, inductivists hypothesis positivists popper and kuhn they all these traditional philosophers of science they have always uh, placed science on a higher pedestal vis-a-vis non science for them science is supreme science is unique okay there must be a demarcation between science and non science and such kind of demarcation autonomy and cognitive authority of science have always have always led the traditional philosophers of science to make a distinction between science and non science therein comes therein lies the significance of paul farabend's interventions when he uh, when he i mean the the kind of uh, interventions that he made okay he has become a legend in his own lifetime okay uh, farabend wrote against method okay he said uh, that uh, what traditional philosophers of science have been doing they have been trying to look at the question what is the method of science is there a method of science can there be the method of science okay that's why farabend repudiated the very idea of scientific method okay he said that uh, what uh, uh, on what basis they are trying to look at the question of uh, or they are trying to answer the question what is the method of science okay only by following consistency condition as well as correspondence condition we have already discussed this and for him uh, this is nothing but law and order philosophy of science okay that uh, 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 but but he also say but, but farabend said uh, you see science is, has made progress science can make progress not through uh, logic and experiment alone but also through if you look at the history of science it has uh, evolved over a period of time and across space through dominant views which are historically conditioned that's why science is historically conditioned even kuhn in passing said this that i mean Uh, science must be examined in terms of its historical integrity okay and then farabend moved on to uh, uh, discuss various things about uh, 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 about not having a particular method of science okay then then if you uh, look at i mean the way farabend uh, uh, um, now propagated an anarchistic method uh, uh, people also say that this is a part of uh, I, i mean not this is a part of this also has led us to look at uh, what kind of uh, utopian pedagogy we can have uh, um, 
uh, if you can look at uh, Richard uh, Day's works on utopia and pedagogy and others uh, 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 or de-schooling by Ivan Illich. Okay? I think Fairhaven provides the framework of this for this kind of uh, characterization of schooling or education or pedagogy or science or training, uh, life uh, and so on. Okay? Now, from if you look at this from ontological questions to the uh, to, to uh, I mean ontological questions uh, uh, about how technology science and society have evolved to the ethos of science to the methods of science and now I mean ethos of science I mean normative structure of science uh, normative institutional framework of science two methods of science and let us now discuss okay, how science is uh, uh, inherently uh, or, uh, or, or sci the, the way science has been designed and controlled okay, is inherently unequal. Okay. Now, let us we will discuss what kind of inequalities that uh, which, which persist in science. Okay. We will discuss inequalities in science in terms of uh, how uh, Robert Merton delineated, uh, discussed these things in, in the 1960s uh, um, uh, till almost almost for, for three decades, he, uh, three, three and a half decades uh, uh, till he died in the uh, uh, in the in the very very early part of the 21st century okay in terms of the matthew effect in science okay i mean how the how the if you look at the slide here okay you will find that uh, how uh, the reward and the communication systems of science are are uh, considered you know, while dwelling upon the matthew effect in science according to Robert King Martin. Okay. I have already discussed, we have already discussed that how Martin uh, uh, though a functionalist, how, how he uh, I mean not I mean uh, if you look at Mertonian functionalism, okay, how he tried to deploy the method of functionalism to understand science, how science is inherently unequal, how science uh, always tries to maintain hierarchy okay, in a given social and political setup, economic setup, cultural setup, institutional setup, ideological setup and so on. Okay. That is why the way Merton tried to look at the Matthew effect in science, okay. what is the Matthew effect will come, will come. Okay. I mean the Matthew effect in science uh, uh, in this, uh, we are going to discuss the reward and uh, communication systems of science. Okay. What is that Matthew effect? Okay. Very quickly, we will try to cover this aspect that the Matthew effect of accumulated advantage described in sociology is a phenomenon sometimes summarized by the adage that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The concept is applicable, I mean the concept of the Matthew effect is applicable to matters of fame or status, but may also be applied literally to cumulative advantage of economic capital. Okay? This term Matthew effect was coined by uh, Merton in 1968, I mean the paper appeared in science. Uh, one of the most prestigious journals in the world okay. and this term takes its name from the parable of the talents in the biblical gospel of Matthew okay. and Merton credited his collaborator and his second wife Harriet Jackerman as co-author of the concept of the Matthew effect. Okay. Now, we will see how, how Merton develops a conception of uh, if you look at this uh, psychosocial processes okay 
uh, uh, how Merton develops a conception of which in which uh, a conception of wage in which uh, certain psychosocial uh, processes uh, affect the allocation of rewards to scientists for their contributions that is an allocation which in turn affects the flows of ideas and findings through the communication networks of science. Okay? And, and such conception is based upon an analysis of the composite experience reported in Harriet Jackerman's interviews with Nobel laureates in the United States of America and upon data drawn from the diaries, letters, notebooks, scientific papers and biographies of other scientists. Okay? Let us let us begin with some general observations uh, on the reward system in science, basing these on earlier theoretical formulations and empirical investigations. Some time ago, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, if you look at the 1940s, 30s, 40s, 50s, also uh, 60s, also, okay, it was noted that uh, the that graded rewards. Uh, in the realm of science are distributed principally in the coin of recognition uh, accorded uh, research by uh, 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 fellow scientists. Okay? And this recognition if you look at is stratified there is a process of social, uh, economic, political, cultural stratification. Okay? This recognition is stratified uh, for varying grades of scientific accomplishment. Uh, as judged by the scientific scientists uh, peer groups, scientists peers, both uh, the self image and the public image of scientists are largely shaped by the communally validating uh, testimony of significant others okay, that they have variously lived up to uh, uh, the, uh, the exacting uh, institutional requirements of their roles. Okay. If, you, if you look at this, okay, a number of workers in empirical studies, okay, a number of workers in empirical studies have investigated various aspects of the reward system uh, uh, of science as thus conceived. Okay. Suppose for example, Glazer. Glazer has found for example, that some degree of recognition is required to stabilize the careers of scientists. In a case study, Diana Crane, okay, Crane um, used the quantity of publication apart from quality. Okay. That is what uh, uh, scholars of I mean experts on scient scientometrics also do today. Okay. That forget quality only, you look at only the number. Okay. Uh, that is why Crane uh, used the quantity of publication apart from quality um, as a measure of scientific uh, productivity and found that um, highly productive scientists um, at a major university gained recognition more often than equally productive scientists as a uh, at a lesser university. Okay? That is why reward system in so far as uh, educational institutions are concerned is also very important. Okay. Similarly, Hagstrom has developed and partly tested the hypothesis that material rewards in science function primarily to reinforce okay, mm, the operation of a reward system in which the, the, the primary award of recognition for scientific contributions is exchanged for access to scientific information. Suppose, Storer has analyzed okay, uh, the ambivalence of the scientists uh, response to recognition as a case in which uh, uh, the norm of disinterestedness, ethos of science, the norm of disinterestedness, okay, institutional imperative of science that we have already discussed, disinterestedness operates to make scientists deny the value to them of uh, influence and authority in science. Merton's collaborator, okay, uh, Jackerman and the Coles, 
have found that uh, scientists who receive recognition for research done early in their careers are more productive later on than those uh, who do not. And the Coles have also found that uh, at least in the case of contemporary American physics, the reward system operates largely in accordance with institutional values of the science in as much as uh, quality of research is more often and more substantially rewarded than mere quantity. Okay? In science as in, in, in other institutional realms, a special problem in the workings of the reward system turns up when individuals, okay? I mean individual scientists or organizations, institutions okay? take, the, take on the job of gauging and suitably rewarding okay, uh, a lofty performance uh, on behalf of a larger community. Okay. That is why we always say that uh, uh, in science you get a lar larger scientific community, uh, but a few peers, okay. uh, peer group is small that okay, becomes small. In this way, okay, uh, what we see that uh, uh, ultimate accolade in 20th century science that is I mean even in the 21st century that is called uh, the Nobel Prize which, which is conferred on uh, many intellectuals. Uh, by the Swedish Academy okay, is often assumed to mark off its recipients from all the other scientists of the time. Okay. Nobel laureates are placed on a higher pedestal because of this reward recognition uh, because of such unequal structures within science. Okay. How unequal we will we'll come to this point. Okay. Yet this assumption is at odds with the, the well known fact that uh, a good number of scientists who have not received the prize and will not receive it uh, have contributed as much to the advancement of science okay, as some to the recipients or more. This can be described okay, uh, in the works of I mean, uh, uh, I mean many many I mean you can look at uh, uh, different uh, works I mean uh, those who have, who have power, uh, 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 those who have authority. Okay, they are rewarded more as compared to those who do not have power and authority. What holds what Martin what Martin try was trying to do here that what what holds the the uh, suppose for example French Academy of Sciences. Okay. What holds for the French Academy for uh, I mean uh, in uh, holds in varying degree uh, for every other institution designed to identify and uh, reward talent. Okay. And in part such circumstance results from errors of judgment for Martin in part this circumstance okay, results from errors of judgment that lead to inclusion of the less talented at the expense of the more talented. Okay. And history serves as an, uh, as an appellate court ready to reverse the judgments of the lower courts which are limited by the myopia of uh, the uh, of contemporaneity okay in this sense okay we will we, come to the matthew effect of the of the reward system i mean uh, i mean uh, uh, i mean reward system in science itself uh, we are discussing now and then the matthew effect in the reward system matthew effect in the communication system and the Matthew effect on a uh, Matthew effect in the functions of redundancy and how social and psychosocial psychological basis of the Matthew effect, Matthew effect and allocation of uh, uh, scientific resources. But, but before getting into this, okay, let us uh, uh, what we are doing when a particular generation is rich in achievements of a, of a very high order, it follows from the rule of fixed numbers that, that some uh, person, some individuals okay, uh, whose accomplishments rank as high as those actually given the award will be excluded from uh, this honorific ranks. Okay. Uh, indeed, their accomplishments sometimes far outrank those which uh, in a time of less creativity proved enough to qualify uh, individuals for this high order of recognition. 